Um, so I've titled this circadian clock and metabolic health. And bottom line is I'm going to be talking about the circadian clock mostly, because that's really what I'm fascinated with and, and the relationship between metabolic health, but just, um, just feel free to stop me and ask any question you might have on any of this basically. So I thought I will give you, even though Selena already said it in my bio, I'll give you a little bit of, uh, what's my journey. Uh, so I was born in the in the end of a valley, <laughs> very close to in the in the Alps, so very close to the Italian border. Uh, and then um, pretty early on in our, our training, my sister and I, my parents relocated themselves uh, to a little closer to something that looks like a city. But I still grew up in a village of seven thousand people, so I think it's relatively small. And I really got fortunate to get a scholarship from the French government to uh, to move to Paris, where I did my my college study. Uh, so you know, I'm I'm a first gen. My parents didn't go to college, uh, so that was really really uh, a huge opportunity for both my sister and I. Actually, so we both moved to Paris. And then after I completed my my college study, I decided to go on and get a PhD uh, because I was fascinated by research. So I did once uh, when I was in Paris, I did a bunch of internship in lab during my master's and I was fascinated by it. And but I decided to go down back to Marseille, closer to my family to pursue my PhD. And in Marseille, I I studied cancer, um, not because I was really fascinated by cancer, but mostly because, uh, you know, that's where the money was. <laughs> uh, and that was the way to get a scholarship so I can get funded through my PhD because there was no way for me to pull it to pull through if I didn't have the funding. Um, and by serendipities, uh, some of my studies in cancer development um, kind of highlighted the fact that depending on what time we were dosing a compound and depending on what time we were injecting uh, the cancer cell, we saw different results. And it was very obvious with cancer chemotherapy that you know whether, whether we were dosing the compound in the morning or at night, uh, we would have different outcome of survival in animals. And that really blew my mind away. Like, you know, after, you know, with my PhD advisor, it was really you know, you're doing something different in the morning or at night because you're more tired, blah, blah, blah. I mean, we had no idea what we were looking at. And then to eventually both of us discovering something such as the circadian clock that could be responsible for maybe the, the phenotype we were observing. And that really set me on the trajectory to go and learn about the, the circadian clock. And that's how I decided to join uh, Dr. Panda Lab in, in, at the Salk Institute in San Diego. Uh, and Dr. Panda was famous for having this, having cloned some of the some of the components of the circadian clock machinery, uh, and I stayed there like uh, quite a bit, uh, studying how clock interacts with metabolic health, and then eventually moved to Utah about a year and a half ago or two years ago now uh, to to open my own lab. Uh, so. Uh, and I, I put a heart here to really tell you that, you know, uh, I'm, I'm really loving it. Like I have, it was a long journey, uh, but I was not that I was ever rushed by time, uh, but I'm I'm really happy that I made it here in a, in a very supportive uh, environment that I, I really like. And I think it's uh, hugely important that you are in an environment where you feel supported and you feel you share some of the value with your, with your colleagues. Anyway, so now let's get into the clock, if you'd like, and let's see if that plays. So uh, this is a movie of a sunflower stem, uh, and it's moving, you know, the, during the day. Uh, I think pretty much everybody knows this, right, that sunflowers uh, move according, they follow the sun, uh, and part of this is called heliotropism as in ilio for sun in latin and tropism as in movement but if it was just guided by the sun there is no reason whatsoever that the plant will come back in an 
in its initial position during the dock, right? You can follow the sun, but then why would you come back? Uh, so then it was further demonstrated later on that this is not just pure heliotropism. It's actually controlled by the circadian clock. So that movement is created by changes in size of the cells in the stem. So, you know, as they, so, you know, like the, oh, that's too complicated to explain uh, for me in English, I mean. Uh, so anyway, the size of the cells varies so that it creates this movement on the cells, on the, on the plants, and that's controlled by the, by the circadian clock. So really, you know what what is the what is the evolutionary what what is the what is the point of this right i mean the point of this of course during the day is to maximize uh exposure to the sun in order to maximize photosynthesis right the more light you get the more photosynthesis you get the more biomass you get uh and now you uh, what the clock does is make you come back in the initial position. So you're basically up and ready to go before the light even comes up. And this is actually a very well conserved um, property of the circadian clock, that the circadian clock is an anti anticipatory system. It really helps you get ready before you even know that something is going to happen. So what about the clock? So it's an internal 24 hour timing system. So it counts the days. It's presenting all life form. Uh, meaning when I say this is, it, it means we haven't identified yet a living form that doesn't have a clock. Uh, so of course, you know, when you think about this, if clocks are everywhere, uh, you can maybe hypothesize that clock will confer an evolutionary advantage, and that's why they've been selected throughout evolution. Otherwise, why bother, right? Uh, and this is a tricky concept, right? I mean, demonstrated what's in what system confers you an evolutionary advantage is not an easy task to demonstrate. It's actually been demonstrated a little bit, if you wish, in the in the plant that I, sh I just show you, the sunflower. Uh, so th this was a study out of UC Davis not too long ago, something like four or five years ago, uh, where they, they got rid of the clock in this plant and then the plant stopped moving, right? It doesn't follow the sun anymore. And as a consequence of this, they are smaller and they have much less biomass. So in that sense, you can say, you could argue that, you know, having a clock helps you by having more biomass. And if biomass is a readout of evolutionary survival or advantage, then you can say, okay, having a clock is beneficial. Uh, and importantly, clock are endogenous, cell autonomous and self-sustained, which really means it's something inside of your body, right? The clock ticks regardless of whether or not you are uh, in your environment. And I guess the best um, um, example of this is imagine yourself in a cave. And these studies have been done in humans where we, you lock people underground in a cave without access to light and people are still able to maintain some sort of diurnal activity where they are awake during roughly you know, 12 hours and then they are asleep during roughly 12 hours. And some of the physiological parameters, they stay rhythmic. Oh, I've lost my control. Oh, and I have a poll, which I haven't activated on, on Zoom anyway, but... Um, I will just, I'm just going to have someone volunteer to answer this question, uh, which is which physiological parameters do you think have a circadian rhythm, sleep, body temperature, blood pressure, leptin, hormonal level, muscle strengths? What do you guys think? Definitely sleep and body temperature included, for sure. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know what leptin is, but I'm going to guess all of the above. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's correct. Awesome. Yeah, leptin is a it's a, a society uh, hormone. So yes, the answer is all of the above. Uh, I think some are like I'm, I I tried to put some that were really obvious, like you know sleep, body temperature. I don't know how obvious it is that muscle strains would have a circadian rhythm, uh, but it does. Uh, so this is like kind of a graphical depiction of 
the parameters, uh, whether they are physical parameters or behavioral or cognitive uh, function that have been shown to display uh, circadian rhythm, circadian activity in humans. Uh, so, you know, blood pressure, cortisol level, uh, insulin. So those are all hormone uh, bowel movement. This is uh, sometimes obvious with kids, <laughs> as I can see, as I can tell. Uh, alertness, coordination. So this is really pertaining to high, you know, uh, um, high motor uh, brain level uh, um, structure behavior. Uh, so not just just not just physical parameters, right? Muscle strength, uh, hormonal. So leptin here as well. Body temperature, and of course. Uh, sleep and activity in, in general. So all of this has uh, really a circadian component to the point where really, you know, I think the idea here is many, many physiological parameters or, or behavior by default uh, have some sort of uh, diurnal rhythm of activity. And the reason for this is that we've evolved on the rotating earth and the earth as this 24 hour rhythm. So you can't escape for this, right? So that there will be rhythm in daylight, there will be associated rhythm in temperature. Uh, so I think the idea is we have developed a system that allows us to synchronize with this environmental cue so that our body dysfunction are much more prepared to act upon the fact that, you know, sun is rising, you know. Um, and it's very interesting to see how throughout evolution, depending on which uh, animal you consider and especially which position they are in the food chain in general, right? Whether you're a prey or a predator, uh, this really dictate whether animals are mostly gonna be diurnal versus nocturnal, meaning being mostly aw uh, awake during the light phase or uh, awake during the, the light phase. Uh, so there is already there's like some sort of concept that food supply uh, or the way you're able to uh, to feed it has some sort of influence on uh, the overall uh, phase of the organism in in comparison uh, in relative to the to the 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 sun or the host rotation. So my lab really uh, well, I mean my lab now and as a postdoc, I was really interested in the concept of trying to understand how the clock influence uh, daily nutritional balance and not has not so much so as, you know, long term uh, body weight control or appetite control and the influence of the clock on this, but really daily, you know, how does the clock interact with metabolic system to maintain uh, balance throughout just a day? So that's for the uh, metabolism aficionado. You really don't have to go into the details of this, but maybe you know something that, you know, when, when we are awake and we feed, we are mostly anabolic, meaning uh, we synthesize stuff, right? I mean, we take on the food and then we synthesize macromolecule in order to store that energy that we harvested from the food. And then at night, when we fast, is really the opposite, right? We're going to take this, this uh, macromolecule energy store that we have stored during feeding time and then break this down to produce energy. So kind of by definition, uh, metabolic rhythm are already in a different stage depending on um, the daylight cycle and the clock activity. So how does the clock work? The clock is a, is in the brain. Uh, it's in the hypothalamus. And it's basically a response to light dark, right? You, so you might have heard, and probably everybody has heard about the whole discussion about blue light and blue shielding at night. Do you guys know what it is? Can someone tell me what, what you understand about the blue light thingy? Why Is do that what, what makes yeah. it harder for you to sleep, for example, when they say, uh, you know, stay off your phones for a couple at like three hours to bedtime. Um, and if you don't, it kind of just makes it harder for, for your brain to shut down. Yes. And do you know why, like, why screen and why blue? Do you know why blue? Oh, no, no idea. <laughs> 
oh well okay well then I'll, I'll tell you something you might be <laughs> able to use so so the way so you you get light, right? It's sense in your in your eyes, and then this information is transmitted to uh, where you go. You get light; it activates your road and cones. You guys know about this, right? That's how you see, right? You see, like that's vision. Uh, but there's a thing called non-image forming vision, where you see, but it doesn't. You don't see an image. What you sense is really the clock, right? You sense is the light intensity, and this is transmitted to your hypothalamus and the hypothalamus has the clock and that's gonna, that's gonna set the clock. Uh, and, and really the clock resets every time you see the light for the first time every 24 hours. So like imagine you're sleeping, you're in the dark, you're not seeing anything, you'll open your blinds and you know it's not daylight saving anymore. So you open your blinds and there's light. And then you get this massive influx of blue light and that entrains your clock because the reality about the, so the absence so of the molecule that sends light in the, in the eyes for, for the clock entrainment is that it's a blue light sensing absence. It's a blue light molecule. Um, it sends blue light, not red, not yellow. It just reacts to blue. So when you get that first blue light, your clock is in train and says, oh yeah, let's, let's get going. It's the morning, you know, let's get going. Food is going to come really soon. How about I'm just going to prepare the system to be ready to, to get that food in and process it in a more efficient way. So anyway, you get that blue. Now the system is designed so that as you progress throughout your day, blue light intensity from the sun reduces and then you start getting tired and then you have your sleep system homeostat that says, oh, you're, you're starting to be tired. I'm going to increase this hormone called melatonin and this is going to bring you to sleep. The problem is that naturally blue light reduces throughout the day unless you get a screen, unless you are in front of an LED screen. Uh, or LEDs in general, that's a big problem because LED spectrum of light is actually much more enriched in the blue light. So that what happens to your clock is that the whole time they get this really strong blue and, and they're struggling, they're like, damn, damn, I should stay awake, I should stay awake because my clock is telling me I'm awake. And this really conflicts with your, with your sleep system uh, so that you're really, you know, no one, your body doesn't really know what they're supposed to do anymore because blue light is telling your body, be awake, go eat, go hunt. Uh, and, and your sleep system is telling you, no, 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 I, I, I should sleep, I'm tired. Uh, so that's the idea of really shielding blue light at night so that you can put your clock to sleep. And if you put to clock your sleep, then you'll allow your sleep system to actually put you to sleep. Does that make sense? Was I able to convey some sort of a message? Um, and the reverse is true. Like, you know, you have the blue light shielding at night. You also have in the northern uh, hemispheres, for instance, where they don't get as much, you know, days are very short and sometimes there's not even daylight. Um, they, um, they have uh, blue light boxes. So what they do is that when they wake up, they, they turn off the blue light box and they shine the blue light on themselves for like 10 minutes. And that entrains the clock. And that's enough to make it, your clock feels like it's in train and it's day, even though it's night outside. It's dark, pitch, pitch dark. So uh, do the, the blue, okay, because there ain't no way I'm not going to be looking at a screen two hours before I go to bed. That's just never, ever going to happen in any way, shape or form. So do the, this is way above and beyond your thing. So just uh, thank you for humoring me. Do the glasses actually work? I think they do. Uh, I think they do. I mean, I think the problem is there's not enough, you know, really, uh, I think for now they are just like, uh, you know, meta analysis, like really non-control, like crossover study design where, where really you control for all the parameters showing that this works. Uh, but I think there's enough evidence uh, shining blue light works for sure. Uh, right. And believe it or not, this has been done for a very long time in the in the International Space Station. Uh, 
because uh, oh, I think yeah, that makes sense. Yes, so they they basically you know it's a, it's a problem for for spatial node and like uh, if you're you know. Uh, for long flight duration or long stay. So they use that as a way to recreate some sort of uh, uh, clock environment. Uh, and they also shed light. Um, so this is the most like control experiment. Otherwise, right. I think like, I think it, I think evidence suggests that it works, but I don't think it has been really tested in a really control like crossover study design the way you would want. It's bronze star evidence, right? Not gold mm -hmm. star. <laughs> Can I jump in real quick on that? I we talked about this in a class recently, and um, I think like not all brands are created equally too. Like there is some like real lower level research that's been done, but it's like some of the so don't jump on Amazon and buy the ten dollar blue blocker glasses is the take home I wanted to <laughs> interject. That's awesome. Yeah, of course, as always, right? It's probably just not the, you know, my shady rays probably don't do much to the <laughs> to the blue light. Uh, anyway, yeah, and I, it really, I think it really, I mean, I have probably 10,000 slides and I really don't care if we uh, go to the end or not, unless you really want me to go to the end, but I'd rather have a discussion on anything you guys think it's interesting. So just don't hesitate. Uh, so anyway, so that central light is in the brain, and then uh, this called this we call this the master clock, or like it's uh, it's supposed to send a signal down to every uh, peripheral clock so that everybody is synchronized, right? So in theory, you get that light, it then trains your central clock, and that central clock is going to entrain all clocks in your in your body, because the idea, uh, and I think like. The way that the system is very complicated is that initially people saw there was only one clock and it was in the brain, right? And it makes sense. The clock is in the brain and then you have projection down to the periphery and then you're all aligned. But it's not true. Like there are clocks in every single cell, right? The same way that we haven't found a living organism without a clock, every single cell of our body has their own clock. The thing is, like it's it's like an orchestra, right? You can have a lot of instruments. All you you need a conductor that's gonna set the tone, and then they can all tick in in phase, kind of. So that's the brain clock. That's what it does. It's just get the light. Um, let's just keep this. So now, uh, about ten years ago or twelve years ago, when I started my postdoc. Uh, this is so we knew that all cells had a clock and we knew that it was a top down system where, where you get the light it hits the brain and then the brains and trains everything everything that's in the periphery but then 12 years ago there was this paper showing that food itself so that that's a tomato it's just food can entrain the liver clock and it wasn't clear whether this was able to entrain the 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 brain clock but anyway it was shown that it was independent and I, i'm going to show you what i mean by this so this was 12 years ago and so this was the really the first demonstration that something can entrain the clock that's not the light and believe me that was like a big revolution and then now what's been shown in the recent years is that it's not just food like other stuff or cues we call them like inform timing information can entrain other peripheral clock and it's unclear what it does on the brain. And exercise is one of them, for instance. Exercise can entrain muscle clock and this has consequences on the liver clock that, that arrow should be added. Still unclear what it does on your, on your brain. But anyway, let me, I'm gonna try to illustrate when I say food and train the liver independently of the, of the brain. So this is a clock gene. BMAL1. Uh, the profile of expression of BMAL1 is that shape thingy, right? So that genes is not expressed at, uh, that would be, would that be midnight? Yeah, okay. So that gene is not expressed at midnight. And then the expression of the genes like start accumulating its maximum at noon. And then in the afternoon, it just starts uh, decreasing, 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 decreasing. And that's a clock genes, right? That's that's how the molecular clock is kind of set, just by 
the um, the oscillation of the expression of these clock genes, right? So this is an example. That's one of the clock gene BMR1, and this is the expression of BMR1 in the liver, right? So it has this nice like uh, oscillation, oscillatory like um, cosine shape. And then this is the expression of that gene BMR1 in the SCN, so it's the, in the brain clock. And as you can see on this drawing, they are what we call in phase, right? They have the same expression uh, profile. So that's a mouse experiment, of course, right? We, we can't look at gene expression in the brain and the liver of a human, not quite yet, right? So the animals here are fed, they have food uh, throughout the day, they can eat whenever they want. Turns out, anim so rodents are nocturnal, right? So they eat only during the, the dark phase. That's what they do mostly. So if you just put the food in the dark phase, uh, nothing really happens because this is their natural feeding time anyway, right? But someone had this idea that they are going to shift food access here. So instead of giving them the food to the dark phase, which is normal, they put the food only during the light phase, right? And this is what happened. It completely shifted the profile of that clock gene expression in the liver, but it did nothing in the SCN. So really the idea here is that what you're seeing, and but we didn't shift the lights, right? We just shifted the food. So what this means is the SCN is seeing light as it should be, and the liver is seeing food. But those guys now are like 12 hours apart. Right. So basically, the SCN time and the liver time are completely anti phase. And that's what we call the desynchrony. So, clock desynchrony, right? That's, that's a concept. In that case, it's an experimental concept where you have different clocks that are in different phase. They are not telling you the same time. But, but we know that this is not good. Like circadian dyssynchrony or circadian misalignment is associated is associated with a ton of disease, right? And we know this from genetic, but we also know this from a behavioral study, right? Shift work is a condition where you're systematically uh, desynchronized by, you know, you still wake up, you sense light, you clock responds to light, but what you do as you know, you feed, you are active, you work, you do it not in synchrony with your light time, meaning you are desynchronized. And we know shift work is a risk factor for cancer and metabolic disease. When we do, I mean, jet lag, right? Everybody knows this, right? If you, so you fly to uh, Boston or Europe, you know what, one of the first thing you're going to uh, experience is probably like sleep di sleep disruption, difficulty to re-entrain to the life cycle. And I mean, for me, like, I think like hunger is pretty obvious. Maybe bowel movement is also, uh, uh, if you start tracking this, you'll see that none of them align in the same way, right? You will have some that are lagging, like you're still hungry, uh, you're hungry in the old time, but your like brain is acting in the new time zone. So See, like if you stop paying attention to this, you'll stop notice, noticing this internal desynchrony in your body. And then in order for this to be completely resynchronized, you know, I mean, we say an hour, uh, a day per hour. So it's it's long, right? Like if you have a six hour jet lag, it's going to take you six days to uh, to completely resynchronize. Uh, and And really like, so does that make sense so far? Yeah this concept of the synchrony and it's bad. Uh, and so my, my study really started when we noticed that the, so high fat diet or energy dense food. So food that is high in fat and high in carb, especially sucrose, uh, that itself was uh, a clock dampening factor. So that itself, well, so we know that food can affect the clock, but what, my, what my study suggested is that the nature of the food itself has a huge influence on how much it's going to affect the clock. So seeing as, so this is the premise of my study. If you get this, then, you know, I don't, I don't really have to go into any details of what I've been doing for the past 12 years, uh, but because that's, that's all you need to understand. 
so so that's so that's the animal I work with. It's a it's a B six mice. Uh, B for black, they're black, they're cute. Uh, I mean, not that the white one are not cute, but um, I'm just used to them. So this is a little mouse. It's an adult at that point. Uh, and as I show you this depiction earlier, uh, they have, so we usually fed a chow diet, which is mostly carbs, right? That's their natural um, chow. And the way they distribute their food intake is that since I, I told you they are nocturnal, right? It's more, it's they're more of a prey. Uh, so they tend to eat at night when when the predators are uh, sleeping. Uh, so so they eat their food mostly during the dark phase, 80% of it. And then they still have uh about 20% of food consumption during the light phase, because uh, not like us. They they don't have like extended period of sleep. They would sleep a little bit and then they wake up and then they, they binge eat a little bit. But anyway, still 80% is done during the dark phase, which is the active phase for them. Okay, so that mice, that mouse is called it's called diet induced obesity model. Uh it's it's used, like I want to give you a number. I think. I think there has been more than a hundred thousand publication in the whole like metabolism type of research using that animal model. We use this to understand the development of obesity, type two diabetes, cardiometabolic dysfunction. Uh, so it's really the gold, the the gold standard in our field. Where what you do is that you give high fat diet to the mice, right? So instead of uh, getting carbs, they are getting a, a ton of fat. And they become obese and they become diabetic. So we've used that for like a century. And that's how we study insulin resistance, like pancreatic dysfunction, heart dysfunction, I mean, you name it. Like anything you want that has anything to do with obesity and, and associated um, disease. Well, this the the experiment I did, which I don't I, I can't even recall why we did this, but we did it. Uh, we were looking at their feeding behavior, right? And so we were interested in knowing when do these animals eat? And what we noticed is that they were basically eating all the time. So there was no such a thing as diurnal or temporal eating pattern. They were just eating constantly, constantly, constantly. So to the point where there was 50% of the food consumption in the dark phase, 50% in the light phase. Uh, so then the question was extremely simple. Like we know this animal is obese and diabetic, uh, likely because they eat the, the they they eat this high fat diet. But how much of this is due to the fact that they eat out of phase, right? Because we know that this eating out of phase is going to have an effect on on their clock. We knew that. So how much of this can be attributed to out of phase feeding and how much of this could be attributed to the clock itself, if any, maybe nothing, right? So that's, so that's why we did time restricted feeding, which 12 years ago was just like um, uh, really a lab manipulation to make sure that the animals only get access to this high fat diet during the dog phase, which is their natural feeding period, right? So uh, we put the food in at the beginning of the dog phase, and then we take it out at the at the at the end of the light phase. And it was for anywhere from eight to twelve hours during the day. Really, really initially, the eight was if the you know some of the undergrads were feeding the animal <laughs> nine or you know whatever whatever how how many long how many hours we were in the lab we will just give them access during the dog phase and so when we did this it was like complete it was completely crazy like at that point i cannot tell you how many times we did the experiment to convince ourselves that this was real, like that we were not studying an artifact. Because when we did this, this is the, this, so this is the one, you know, the diet induced obesity model, they eat all the time. And this is the time restricted feeding guy that only had access during the dog phase. So natural feeding phase. Uh, so they were much leaner. So this would be like the, the fat guy. Um, and this is the TRF guy. So they were much leaner uh, and there were, and which was mind blowing is that they were eating the same amount of food. 
So really, at that point, it became isocaloric, even though it was not supposed to be isocaloric. So despite the fact that they were eating as many calories, the fact that they were all eating these calories during the dog phase would pre was prevent them from being sick and obese. Um, so that's that's how the story started. And then, and then of course, like you know, this was 2012, and there was I think uh, so. F I mean, at least from from me that I contributed to, and in Dr. Pena group, we had like five. I think five follow-up studies where we showed, um, what was it? This one was looking at the influence of the diet. Uh, there wasn't really any influence of the diet. This one was really looking at, uh, can you use time-restricted feeding as an intervention? AKA, if you take the animal in the obese and diabetic state, can you then restrict the timing on food consumption? And is it gonna help them lose weight? and get more metabolically healthy? And the answer was yes, which was really, really uh, super cool, right? Because it, it did really create an opportunity for, uh, for translation of this finding to maybe a, a population, I mean, for like a weight loss intervention type. Uh, well, that was it. And then the most recent one, uh, which is 2021, so it's very recent, was really looking at uh, in preclinical model again, because I don't do translation uh, uh, really. So everything that I've told you so far was done in this young black mice uh, and it's a male because that's what we do. Uh, we completely bias our results. Uh, it's biased on strain, it's biased on sex, it's biased on age, uh, out of convenience, I think. And this was acceptable, uh, you know, up to maybe 10 years ago, this is not acceptable anymore. Uh, so we set up to test whether this was independent of sex and also whether the age of the animal actually had an effect of uh, what we've been observing. And I'm not gonna go into the details, but I'm just gonna describe this one. So this, you see here, this is the old males. So where you put them on the high fat diet and they gain weight. And if you have them on TRF, they don't gain weight even more so than the young one. So, you know, if you're an old male, it's awesome. By all means, do TRF. Now, here's the kicker. This is the old female. It doesn't do anything. So really, you know, one of the reasons we really need to test our intervention in both sexes is for this type of result. So it's called, you know, sexual dimorphism. Uh, clearly, the females in that case will not protect it from weight gain. But... On the pro side, and this was and this was even crazier, uh, we still saw some metabolic benefits. So in that context, in the female animal, there was a complete dissociation between the weight effects and the metabolic benefits. So they were still metabolically healthier when they were on TRF than when they were like ad libitum fed, right? So this would be like NASH or accumulation of fat in your liver, which is a big problem in the, in the, in the United States right now. And this is just a quantification. And if you don't understand the graph, that's okay. But just uh, believe me that, you know, when they were on Adlib, they had severe NASH. And when you put them on TRF, NASH was reduced, uh, which, which is super cool, even though they were the same uh, body weight. Oh, and I have a poll in the, and I'm going to almost stop so we can talk. And, but then, so this is perfect timing to stop. Um, when I, even though I don't do clinical work, uh, there's some people in my former lab went on and tried to move this to the translational uh, uh, sphere, right? To really test uh, time-restricted feeding. So it's called time-restricted feeding 10 years ago. Now it's called time-restricted eating because people don't like being told to feed. Uh, so it's called time restricted eating. Uh, but this is the, the first question that we set up to answer back in 2014, I think, was this one. Uh, how long do people eat? And believe me, that was not an easy question. And the results were kind of mind blowing. So you can answer to yourself, like how long do you think is your, is your um, eating window, like daily? And then I can tell you what we found. Uh, 
this was the first study and it's kind of i think it's been reproduced to a, to a much bigger set of the population but we basically found that 50% of adults eat for over than 15 hours so clearly it it's spread out right it's not just limited to your to your clock time which really poses this as a possible intervention in humans right it is it is possible conceptually to tell them reduce your eating window without changing your diet quality or quantity and see if that makes you uh, healthier and and clear right i mean oh this is not up to date so this is this is extracted from clinicaltrial.gov where i was looking at uh, uh time restricted eating uh, clinical trial right now, and this is 77 because I haven't updated it, uh, but I think a week ago, as of a week ago, I think there was 125. Uh, so clearly we don't have an answer. Like I, I can't tell you whether it's gonna be any good. I don't think it's gonna be bad. Uh, I don't know that it will be better than than other um, approach, uh, but we will know eventually. Uh, and I'm gonna stop sharing well now i have deactivated my so i don't know how to do this mm. Mm. i got rid of my control panel i was really happy about this but now i don't know how to put it back on can uh here somewhere no Did Hi. you did you close uh, stop share screen and then it'll yeah let me see see I close it you know that panel where you have all the I got rid of it earlier because it was in the middle of my slide I was so happy about it but now I don't know how Can you go up to view options next to the mm -hmm. green bar not in PowerPoint click outside of the PowerPoint window uh, I'll zoom then yeah yeah the problem is she she hid that zoom. whole toolbar oh so she can't click on the view i have it back I yay it back. stop sharing awesome yeah okay. i understand that problem <laughs> awesome well thank you guys um i'm happy to take question if you if you'd like i guess i have one question that might be kind of far reaching from what you're looking at or maybe you know from what people have been studying but can you maybe talk a little bit about what you think the reason you see this sex difference in kind of like a, a weight gain versus metabolic protection or metabolic disease protection yeah i mean it, we have I mean, there's a couple of fight but is it first off it's it's not new that we would observe sex differences in animals in terms of uh, weight gain and response to body weight loss in general. It's just something that is very strongly sexually dimorphic, uh, something that clearly has a lot to do with estrogen receptor signaling. So estrogen and estrogen receptor signaling uh, is clearly very differentially in humans, right? You would have... Uh, woman physiology is this too, right? It's like men is pretty much the same across their lifespan. Uh, women is two different things. There's premenopause and postmenopause, right? And those are two different things. Uh, the, the caveat with animal with this rodent model is there's no such a thing as uh, postmenopause. They don't really go menopause. So it's not a good model to study this, unfortunately. So the best model to do this is just to overectomize them and then like simulate uh, a, a menopausal state, but it's a little it's a little crude. So it's not. It's, uh, but I mean, there's a lot of initiative right now to try to maybe get better model of uh, wo women reproductive stages at the preclinical model right stage. So yeah, we can investigate uh, mechanism and and you know, yeah, my standpoint. I mean, there's, there's a reason why I do preclinical and not uh, translational research. Right? From my standpoint, I think my stand as a preclinical researcher is that I really assume that everything is bad. Like human physiology is pretty well, you know, it's, it's good system. It works generally, right? So I'm just going to assume that everything is bad until demonstrated otherwise. 
And I, and the reason why I'm telling you this is that you know estrogen supplementation was a big thing. I mean, everything suggested that estrogen supplementation was going to be good, right? It was going to help women with so many like problems like weight balance, cardiometabolic, increased risk of cancer. And you know what? They just pull it out, right? Because all the studies so far shows that it's bad. It increases everything we hypothesize would get better upon estrogen supplementation. Uh, so yeah, woman physiology is still a big thing. I'll chime in a little bit there, Emily, as well, because this is something that we work on. Um, the the place that we've come to intellectually is one of the key problems is that um, thinking about it as two only two states is very reductive. Um, so the concentrations of estrogen and progesterone um, and the forms of estrogen that are dominant, um, along with minor hormones that we don't really think about, like luteinizing hormone and FSH, um, vary across a cycle. Um, and supplementation and even animal experiment, experiments where we try to better supp to better to better you know mimic what happens. We it's actually impossible to do the dynamic curve of hormones that would occur over a 25 to 28 day cycle um, in a woman. And the postmenopausal supplementation back is a fixed dose. And it's usually only estrogen. Um, and that's actually not a state that's ever actually encountered in female physiology. Um, but it's still extremely complicated and no of us, none of us actually understand the ratio of sex hormones needed to modulate metabolism. Like we, we know reductionistly um, what cells express estrogen receptor, sort of, what cells express progesterone receptor, um, but it's extremely complicated to actually mimic the normal state. Um, so, you know, these are things 30 years later, we still don't really understand. Oh, and by the way, if you, if you like, if you want to know, I'll just add the, the, so even in mouse model, I think, so the PhD student that contributed to this work on the sex differences, she's now looking at the clock itself in ovaries as a function of the stage. Uh, and actually the clock ticks at different speed and amplitude depending on even the cycle. And in animals, it's really fast, right? It's four days, four or five days. So she sees huge differences, whether you're in diestrus and estrus. So just to add a level of complexity in that if it wasn't complicated enough. <laughs> so do people often just use, because of all this complexity, just use male mouse, male mice? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, and, and also, and as Kiki was saying, the, the thing is the, 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 I think the female model is just, it's a terrible model. Like it's just a terrible translational model. It's very difficult, so. Interesting. Yeah, but it's, I mean, you're not, you're not allowed to anymore um, for good reason, because pharmaceutically, we've only been helping males. Um, <laughs> we've, uh, we've put zero pro products to market that are beneficial to, to women. Um, so, you know, NIH requires you to, if you're not going to use both sexes, uh, justify it. Even um, in animals, even in mice. Yes, in mice, it's required. Yeah, and it's is good. It's poor good. driving. It will really likely, you know, push the development of better models. And for that matter, like the diurnal, I mean, like if you push me that direction, like that B6 model is a terrible model for clock studies itself, right? For me, because they are nocturnal. So, you know, translationally, it's completely out of phase compared to what a human being would be. So they are better models, like hamsters that we have diurnal hamsters. Uh, but, you know, it's always the trade-off between the better model as opposed to the genetic, right? Like my, my ultimate goal, like the, in the clock paper, we use like five different model of genetic knockdown of the clock in different animal tissue to really try to get at this inter-organ communication, like who's the, who's the orchestra, like who's, you know, 
So the thing is, this tool is amazing because you have all the genetics where you can knock down genes or overexpress gene in specific tissues. So that's part of the rationale for sticking with that, you know, um, animal, the mouse nocturnal model. So, you know, there's, there's, you know, there's always benefit and risk, like ben pros and cons ratio that you have to take into consideration. But it would be good to have at least some sort of a female model develop. And maybe it takes like, I don't know, Kiki, what you're saying, maybe mini pumps, maybe different mini pumps implantation where you can change the, the dosage, the ratio of the different almonds that they get. Like, why not? Yeah, it's, it's, um, it's what's needed is a technological change. So most implants are passive diffusion. Um, and so the matrix is set with a set rate of passive diffusion. Um, so it would require switching to active pumps um, and then a size difference, a size thing. There are decent active pumps for larger animals like rats, mm -hmm. um, but to go down to the, to the right scale for mouse, the active pumps aren't as good. Um, so, but theoretically it's something that's overcomable, um, but it's an engineering problem at this point. Yep. Well, I thought this was very cool. I don't have any smart questions to ask you because I'm a psychologist. And so I don't know a, a lot of this stuff, but uh, it was it was fascinating and it was fun to kind of think about you know the practicalities of this and to actually start understanding a little bit the kind of the the science behind all these things that we hear.